of grace, in need of love, in need of mercy raining down from high above. Our very fast world of supersonic internet connectivity, fast technology, fast cars, 30 seconds WhatsApp and social media statuses, 30 seconds media clips, very short attention span, comes a slow voice this evening telling us that 30 seconds is not enough to build anything worthwhile. Legacy is worthwhile, and re legacy requires building. In 30 seconds, we cannot build legacy. It is easy for one to think, assume, that those who leave legacies behind are those who are very wealthy, or those who are well educated. It is easy for us to think that legacy is left behind by the elite group alone. But I must remind us and tell us this evening that everyone leaves behind a legacy. Whether you plan to or not. Every word you say Every contact you make and everything you engage in leaves an imprint of yourself on those you come in contact with. And that forms part of your legacy. I'll tell you the story of an African hunter. The story is told of an African hunter who went into the forest to get some game for his family so they could feed. This hunter traveled farther and farther into the forest, but he could not get any animal to kill. He continued in hope, pressing further into the thick of the forest, hoping to find an animal so that he could return home with some food. As time progressed, night drew closer, yet he had no game. He had exhausted his supply of food and water and he hoped that perhaps if he could press a little further, he could find some animal. He proceeded. Hope to get animal became thinner and thinner by the second. At the point he decided when he came to his sad realization that he wasn't going to get any game that day, he thought that perhaps he would make his way out of the forest, but he had gone too far into the forest, and his strength was failing him. He knew that if he made an attempt to return, he would probably die before he got out of the forest. So he decided that the game was over. The best he could do was to look for some cave to lie his weak body and perhaps die, so that no animal will find him to eat and devour. Perhaps he will die peacefully. This hunter started to look for a cave where he could just lay his tired body and pass on to the grave beyond. While he searched for a cave, staggering in the thick forest, behold, he came to an open space, sort of a field. And he was wondering, why this kind of space right in the thick forest? And when he looked up a building with an inscription on it, food is ready. All you eat is free. It has been paid by your ancestors. He could not believe his eyes. Was he already dead and seeing visions of heaven, he thought to himself. But he hit himself and shook himself a little and he was alive. He made his way right into the building. True to what he had said, there was a lot of food in there. And people were having a really nice time. Two beautiful ladies 
attended to him immediately. They gave him two jugs of milk and he took it down. Immediately he regained some strength. Could he be dreaming? No, it was real. He just had quality milk. And they asked him, what would you want, sir? And he said, what do you have? Anything you have. But he was still worried that he had no money on him. So he asked them again, is it true that anything I eat in here is free? And they affirmed, yes, it is free. I said, if that is the case, get me good amala with some nice meat in the native soup. And it was brought him just the way he ordered it. He ate to his fear and did not know where he slept off. Our dear hunter, after a while of quality sleep, got up and decided to make his way home. So he asked the attendants who were waiting by him, can I go home with some food? At least to help me through the long journey back home. And he said, oh, you may have whatever you want. And they filled his can with some water, some wine, and meat in his bag for the journey. Our dear hunter stood up, satisfied, as he made his way to the door to leave this very wonderful building. He heard a voice that filled the environment saying, hold on, sir, you have not paid. And our father was startled. He asked the voice, I thought you said that anything I eat here is free. The voice said, yes, it is free. You have not been, you have not paid. He said, so why am I required to pay now? The voice responded, Everything you ate has been paid by your ancestors. But you have to pay so that the children coming after you will also have a free meal. Beloved, whatever you have today, whatever you enjoy today, is because someone left it for you. And you are responsible to the coming generation to leave behind some legacy too. Our parents have done a lot for us. Guardians have done a lot for us. Older ministers have done a lot for the church. The Church of Christ in Choba community is what it is because some others have passed through this path and they left behind a legacy. What legacy would you leave for the coming generation after us? Remember, everyone leaves a legacy and everything we say and do leaves imprints of our lives on those around us. Every generation has a price to pay so that the generation coming after would live a better and more fulfilled life. Sadly, just as the speakers before me had noted instant gratification is killing our generation. We want it now and we want it fast. But anything that is worthwhile is worth planning for, is worth building. Planning and holiness are not got in one day. Holiness is built for a legacy after we leave earth. Planning is for a day that is coming tomorrow, which is not yet here. And every one of us have equal opportunity to leave behind good legacy. It doesn't depend on how much you have. It doesn't depend on the quality of your education. You can leave legacies, and the best legacies are free. You can leave behind a legacy of love. You can leave behind legacy as a peacemaker, a peace builder. You can leave behind legacy as an encourager, a son, a daughter of encouragement. You can leave behind 
a legacy of punctuality. Even in your congregation, you can leave behind legacies of preaching the word. You can leave behind legacy breath in you. There is an opportunity to leave a rich legacy. And there's only one thing I will ask you to do if you want to leave behind a legacy. Build excellence around your purpose or your chosen niche. Build excellence around your purpose or your chosen niche. It's as simple as that. Whatsoever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. Do it with diligence. And do you see a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings and not before men. men. How diligent are you? Make a list today of the legacy you would like to leave behind. Work on it every day. Plan towards it. Work towards it. Perfect holiness and the fear of God. And I tell you that you will begin to live in the fullness that God created you to experience. So that, as recorded in the book of Joshua chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, when the children after us will ask us what these stones mean, we'll be bold enough to tell them of the wonderful story of God's faithfulness while we were young. It is my plea that all of us together continue to impact our world, our immediate society, our churches, our workplaces, positively, free of charge. And our lives will be better for it. If just this number here decides to take what we have studied today, put them into practice, I'm sure our world, our churches will be a better place to live. May God help us as we go home with this to put into practice and help through His Holy Spirit that we might understand better than every word that has been said here giving us the strength to will and to do in Jesus' precious name. Welcome to this edition of our program. This is Church of Christ TV. And today, we have a very, very interesting topic for you. It's simply captioned, Believing a Lie. I remain Osita Onwara. We are in a world where it's either you are telling the truth or you are telling a lie. It's either you have believed the truth or you have believed a lie. When a lie, which we know to be an untrue statement, falsehood is believed, it has consequences. For that reason, we are careful with what we believe. It has been said in certain quarters that Nigeria is in the state she is now because we believed a lie. They came and they gave lies to us and we believe these lies and that is why we are where we are now. I don't know if that is the case or I don't, have, I don't want to make an opinion on this. But what I know for sure is that when you believe a lie, you pay the price. Believing a lie. When you have a statement that is not true, you call that a lie. When you also have a statement that is a partial truth, it is also a lie. And this is where we have to be careful. A partial truth is a lie. A falsehood is a lie. But let's go to the Bible and see how we are going to break down this lesson into those that will believe and those that will believe a statement that was never true in the first instance. And those that will also believe statements that are partial truth and also it will amount to a lie. Let's look at the case of a young prophet in 1 Kings chapter 13. Now this story is instructive 
because you will find that this young prophet did not believe when other people spoke to him on what he needed to do. But when an older prophet spoke to him, he believed that older prophet. Why did he do that? Maybe he believed it because he saw him as his colleague. Or maybe he believed it because, yes, this is a man of God, and a man of God cannot lie. And because he believed men of God don't lie, he went in and he paid daily for it. 1 Kings chapter 13 from verse 18 down to 19. He said to him, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. Now the Bible now emphasized in bracket here, he was lying to him. In verse 19, we are told, so he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. You see that this older prophet, this, you see that this old prophet lied to this young man. And the young man believed this lie from this old prophet. Now, why am I feeling so bad for this young man in this story? He was expressly told by God, go into that town, speak to the altar, prophesy against the altar. Do not eat nor drink in that town. And do not go back the route which you came from while on this assignment. The instruction of God was clear without ambiguities. And this young man went there, prophesied against the altar. In fact, while he was there, according to that First Kings chapter 13, the king was there sacrificing on the altar. And as the young prophet prophesied against this altar, the king stretched forth his hand, asking that the, the prophet should be seized. And we are told that as the king stretched forth his hand, the hand was stiff. It was then the king realized that there was a higher power at play. And he besought the young prophet to appeal to God on his behalf so that he would get well. Of course, the young prophet did that. The young prophet, that is, told the king that I cannot go with you to your place because the Almighty has told me neither to eat nor drink in this town and I should not go back the way from which I came. You see, the entertainment, the grandeur of being hosted by a king this young man rejected it because he was afraid of the Almighty. He wanted to obey the voice of the Almighty and he left without going to the king's house nor eat from the king's sumptuous delicacies. But while living, this old prophet came to him and lied to him. He told a religious lie. And this young man, believing that lie, went back to the town. The young man, of course, did not go back to the town because of how sumptuous the delicacies he was going to get from the prophet was. No, because if that was what was his intention, he would have fallen for that from the king. He rejected the king's offer, but accepted that from the old prophet. Many of us are victims of this. Many of us have been held captive by religious lies. You can see in 
our world today, what people do in the name of religion, some make me cry. You will see people, how they will go out, eat grass because they've been told to do that. You will see people doing things that a right-thinking man will not do, all in the name of religion. Are you among these that have been caught captive by religious lies like this young prophet? Believing a lie. Sadly, God did not exonerate the young man because he believed a lie. Sadly, the anger of God was on him. He died a most shameful death. Because to the Jews, if you die and you are not taken back to your father's place, to rest in the place of your fathers, then it's not a good thing. This young man was killed by a lion, and the lion did not devour his flesh, showing a signal that his death was actually caused by the Almighty himself. Have you not read when the Bible says, let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the gutter. Are you a blind follower? You too will pay the price if you believe a lie. Because the essence of Christ saying when a blind leader leads the blind, they will all fall into the pit. Means that the follower was not careful at looking at what was at play. He followed blindly. He did not look at the details. He did not go back and say, wow, why is this so? Should it be so? No wonder the Bible says we should prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Are you a blind follower? Let us remind ourselves of certain things that we play with religiously. So the example we are going to take should be that we found in the Bible. I'm going straight to Romans chapter 10. Let's look at verse 1, 2, and 3. Let's hear what the Bible has to tell us in that place. Brethren, my heart desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Can you see right here that the Holy Spirit is saying that Israel, they have a zeal for God, but their zeal is not backed up by knowledge. Now, it went on to say in verse 3, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. What do we find here? Israel had their own way they thought they would do things different from the way God has already commanded. They were ignorant of the right way. And because they were ignorant of the right way, whereas they had zeal, they have not submitted to the truth that is in God's way. Are you like them? Let's go further to confirm. In Mark chapter 7, verse 7, we are told something. Let's see what the Bible is speaking to us in that place. It spoke about those then, and I think it also applies to us. Mark chapter 7, verse 7. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. In vain they worship me, 
teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So when you are following what man has commanded as against what God has commanded, then you are also believing a lie. But let's go again to Mark chapter 16, verse 16. It is there that when you believe and you are baptized, you will be saved. But you will be told that only believing alone is sufficient for you to be saved. Of course, it's right there in the scriptures, in Acts chapter 16, where Paul told the jailer that believe in the Lord and your household and you will be saved. But is that all there is to it? Remember, I told you that a partial truth is also a lie. Now, let's have this illustration. Peradventure, as blind men, you went and touched an elephant. You know how an elephant is. Those that would touch the trunk of an elephant, how would they describe the elephant? Those that would touch the tail of the elephant, how would they describe the elephant? If the one that touched the tail of the elephant argues that the elephant is like a rope, is it correct? Is the elephant like a rope? Of course not. But he touched the tail. The tail is part of the elephant, but that is not all there is to an elephant. And that is how some of us have believed a partial truth which ultimately is a lie. Pharaoh fell victim to this in Genesis chapter 12. When Abraham, seeing how beautiful the wife was, told Pharaoh that, in fact, he, he told the wife first, they planned, they schemed, that look, when you get there, Tell them that you are my sister. You remember the story? And of course, when they got there, when the, the princess of Egypt saw Sarah, and she said she's uh, Abraham's sister, Pharaoh took her, and his family was split until he went and discovered in his own way, called Abraham, says, why did you not tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she was your sister? When Abraham also played this taunt and he was confronted, he said, yes, indeed, she's my sister because she's the daughter to my father's whatever, whatever. Is that, was that all there was to the relationship between Abraham and Sarah? Of course, Sarah was the sister. That is true. That is a partial truth. That is not the whole truth. So when you believe a partial truth, you have believed a lie. And when Pharaoh believed that partial truth, which was a lie, he paid dearly for it. His family was plagued by it. So when you, today, you believe that yes, once I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I am saved, that is a partial truth. That is not the whole truth. And because that is not the whole truth, you will be eternally lost. So, yes, the Bible says you must believe. In fact, John 3, 16 is a popular passage that says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have ever everlasting life. Yes, that is what the Bible has said. But I am telling you today that that is not the whole truth to this. There are other things that you must also do in your quest for salvation. And the next one, having believed, as we've seen in the Bible, what also you must do is that you must repent. Yes, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, he told them this. Let's hear what he told them. After they have asked, in verse 37 of Acts chapter 2, look at what the Bible has to tell us. Now, when they heard this, they were caught in the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? In verse 38, which is the passage I really want us to understand, he now said, then Peter said to them, repent and be and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ 
for the remission of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Remember, when Paul was talking in Acts chapter 16, he told the jailer that you should believe. And that is where many of us feel that once we have believed in the Lord Jesus, then we are saved. But look at what Peter also said here. That not only must you believe, you must also repent. In fact, Christ himself in Luke chapter 13, verses 3 and 5, made it clear that if you don't repent, you will all likewise perish. So when you believe, yes, you've taken a good step. You must also repent of your sins. That is the next thing you must do. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, we are told that we must make a confession of our faith. So it's not just enough to believe and you keep it to yourself. It's not just enough to repent and you end there. No, you must make a confession of your faith that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Are you seeing them? So if somebody now argues that just believing and you are saved, that person has told you a partial truth. And when you believe it and you do only that, you cannot be saved. And also once you repent, yes, ah, there are many of us that repent from all the evils we've been doing. I have been drinking all my life. I don't want to drink again. I have been womanizing all my life. I don't want to womanize again. I have been doing... I've been involved in idolatry. I don't want to serve idols again. And if that is all you have done, that again cannot save you. Only repentance cannot save you. So when you stop doing evil and you end just there, you cannot be saved. Because only your goodness can just save you. Being good alone can save you. If you doubt, ask Cornelius. In Acts chapter 10, the Bible says that he was a devout man, a man that fears God, doing so many wonderful things. He was an upright man in a corrupt world, but he needed Christ. So you find that repentance alone can save you. Because if it could, Cornelius, Cornelius, a, an, an upright man in a corrupt world, was not just saved without Christ. Peter had to come to tell him what he must do to be saved. Peter introduced Christ to him. And we are told that Cornelius and his household were baptized that same day. So you find that just repenting alone just cannot save you. Believing alone cannot save you. No wonder Christ said in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, that he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now, who will you believe now? The man that is telling you, yes, that is telling you the partial truth, that believe in Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Or the Savior himself that is saying, when you believe and you are baptized, you shall be saved. What have you believed? What are you practicing? It is what you believe that will necessitate what you practice. So will you want to believe man and jeopardize your salvation? Or you want to believe in the master himself, the author of eternal salvation? What are you believing? Now, I have noticed, and noticed most painfully, that we are careful in the things of this life more than the things of God. We are careful in the things of our business transactions rather than the business of God. Once a man of God, in quote, tells you anything, you believe it and you accept it hook, line, and sinker. The carefulness we put in our business, we don't put it in religion. And that is how religion has been bastardized that anything goes. You will see a responsible man, a captain of industry, whose head is being toyed with religiously. It shouldn't be so. We must not believe religious lies. We must shine our eyes. 
We must open our eyes. We must ask questions. No wonder Christ said you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Why is it that we are believing so much lies? There's this young man that was so careful. In fact, I witnessed it myself and I, I, I don't feel talking about this when I'm discussing this matter. He was called by a prophet. On his way, the prophet just saw him and said, wow, young man, your future is so bright. But enemies, they've ganged up to make sure you don't achieve what God has destined you to be. That great man God has destined you to be is because of the work of enemies. And the young man was interested because he has finished school, he's not gotten a job, and all of that. And he asked the man, what should I do? He said, well, go and bring your mother. Your mother is the cause of all your problems. This is where my church is. Come with your mother. Once you, you are able to get there with your mother, then be rest assured that you'll be set free. The young man said, okay. But while going, he started asking himself questions. My mother, the lady that suffered all these years to train me to through school, the lady that will do everything beyond her powers to ensure that I have the best of everything, she's the same one that is bewitching me, he said, okay, no problem. When he got home, he just told the mother that, please, you are going to accompany me to a place. But when you get there, don't say you are my mother. Say you are my sister. You want to say what? He just said, just follow me, mommy. Let's go. When you get there, say you are my sister, not my mother. They said, okay. And they went to the prophet's place. When they got there, the prophet said, hey, have you come with your mother? I said, no, sir. My mother said she will not join you. So I came with my sister. Even my sister has been struggling. She has, she's been having so many problems in life. So I said, let me still bring her to you so that you can just help the two of us. He said, yes, I know it. Your mother will not come because she knows when she steps her feet here, she will be destroyed. She will be exposed. You, mother, it is your mother that is also causing these problems for you. Just the way she's, she's been causing problems for this, your brother. And she he started ranting, saying all sorts of lies. In fact, the mother could not bear it anymore. It was the fight that ensued when this woman jacked this man that we came to meet and we saw the story. Just imagine if this young man had believed this lie. Just imagine what would have happened to the relationship between this good mother and this good son because of somebody that wants to take, that is taking on due advantage of situation. It's told a religious lie. There are many of you out there whose relationships have shattered. You don't talk to your mothers, you don't talk to your fathers, you don't talk to your neighbors, you don't talk to your friends because a pastor out there has told you lies. Are you part of this? There are places that you should have gone to to be better in life. But because you have believed religious lies, you are not there. There are some of us that don't eat certain meats. There are some of us that don't wear certain clothes. Because we've been lied to religiously. Meanwhile, the Bible says that God has given us all food to eat with thanksgiving. Who are you believing? Should you believe the Bible or you should believe man? Believing a lie. So we are saying here that a partial truth is a lie. So if you've been told that yes, just believe in Jesus Christ and say the sinner's prayer, then you are saved. I am begging you. That is not the truth. Yes, it is a partial truth, but that is not the whole truth. And that is why in the legal circle, they will say you are there to tell the truth. 
the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Because if you tell a partial truth, you will mislead the judge. You will mislead people. Yes, we tell partial truth. We don't tell the whole truth. So we are asking you, yes, people will be out there telling you partial truth. It is for you to investigate. Because when you believe that partial truth, which is a lie, you will pay the price. Pharaoh is our example. So, in religious matters, the Bible says, prove all things and hold on to that which is good. It is for you to investigate. It is for you to show due diligence, just as you show in your businesses, just as you show in every other thing. Show it in religious matters. Because everything you are doing due diligence for, being careful for, ends right here. But your soul is paramount. How can you play gamble? How can you gamble with your soul? You shouldn't be. You should be more careful with religious matters. You should be more careful with spiritual matters. Don't allow yourself to be misled. Have you believed a lie? whether religiously or otherwise. It is time for you to start coming back. It is time for you to start asking questions. It is time for you to start investigating. And that is why we are here today, calling you to investigate the Church of Christ. Yes, the Church is the pillar and ground of the truth. If you must worship God, and you worship him acceptably, then you must start investigating the church of Christ. Our doors are open, 247, like we, rightly, we commonly say. Invest, invest, go to the church of Christ that is closest to you. Ask questions, and you'll be told what you must do in order for you to be saved. Until we meet again next time, I ask that the grace of God should speak for you always and help you to be able to comprehend and accept the message that God wants you to accept and be saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, welcome to COC TV. My name is Gentle Wamana. And on this session, we have Brother Mike Udam, a minister from Opagada Cross River State. Pleasure. Hello, viewers. Good to have you. And it's my pleasure to be here to share God's word with you also. Today, I want to be taking you, sir, on the issue of marriage. We know what marriage is. Marriage, the living and the cleaving, man and wife, okay, that's fine. But there are so many issues surrounding this that we want to talk about. What is marriage? How do you see marriage? Uh, well, I think that uh, marriage is a very strong business. But unfortunately, the new players in that business don't understand the business. You know, a lot of people now marry for several reasons, some based on societal pressure, some based on office pressure. I use the word office in quote. This is what they do for anybody that is married. Also because of newfound political association. You know, when you are a PA to a governor, I know that if you get married during that time, all the political heavyweight will come and they'll contribute money. Just get married. So there are several reasons why people get married. And for me, marriage as, a, as it is today is not wearing the toga. It was supposed to wear from the Bible. My parents just celebrated 52 years of being married. Oh, wow. And I'm 17 years in marriage. So I understand what I'm saying. Today, the young people are not, they, they married today, not quite long, it's broken. Sometimes even when they are married by the fact that they are married, the rate of extramarital affairs is high. So we are not respecting the moral sanctity of that institution. And it calls for concern. You are questioning the reasons for those marriages. What is the reason for marriage? Major reason for marriage. One, companionship. Two, procreation. Procreation, that's uh, to go and increase and multiply. 
Where does love come in here? Uh, love is just a vehicle. And a lot of people have not understood the concept of love. Some even think you love before you marry. They have not known that you marry and you love. I'd like you to throw more light on this. Of course, gentle, I saw your sister the other day, beautiful. You didn't negotiate with your mother that she should be your sister. You grew up in the same house and you grew to like her. You could have your differences. You have no option than to just like her. She's your sister. Love is inside marriage, not outside marriage. What people see outside marriage before they marry is infatuation. Because if you say, I love her, I love her, how come the wife you love two years after you don't love again? There was something that was driving you. So this, for this conversation to be very healthy, we need to go back to understand the dynamics. Adam was given Sarah, uh, was Eve. given Eve. Okay. There was no day he stayed and remembered to check. Right? Abraham's son, they went and married Rebecca for her. There was no place that we saw them try to see how they want to. You see, the point I'm trying to make is that when we understand that when two persons have come together as husband and wife, they owe each other a duty to make the marriage work. But before they can do that, they need to be prepared. On the continent of Africa, we prepare most of our female children. Oh, sit like this. Women don't sit like this. Dress like this. Do like this. Cook this food like this so that you can have because when you marry, you'll be able to care for your husband. How many parents have taken time to see their sons and say, you don't raise a hand on the, your, your wife. You don't speak disrespectfully. You don't call your wife out when she's wrong in public. Nobody. The men are not prepared. So once they just have the money, they start looking for a woman to marry. And since the women want to feel fulfilled societal demand, they are not even asking the men whether they are ready for marriage. So that's the problem. I was ready for marriage. I married at 31. You are 17 years now, you give me 48 years. I knew a father, a friend of my father who said, your son is not ready for marriage. Was he looking at your age? Yes. Does preparation for marriage start? When a man is emotionally ready, psychologically ready, spiritually ready, and to a large extent financially ready. Okay. Because he has to pay bills. He has to pay bills. He is not getting married to come and be waiting for his wife to pay bills. Because he was the one that brought the wife. That's why we want to talk to young people. When you are captivated by the shining nature of the woman, Always remember, there are bills you are going to pay. And none is less important. Spiritual, spiritual uh, readiness, physical well, well, readiness, yes. emotional readiness, and financial readiness. Yes. They all have to be in place. Yes, they have to be in place. And see, see the, point, the point, when you, when you enter a conversation on marriage, I tell young people, relax. Find out your tolerance level. You know why? Marriage is nonsense tolerating institute. You will tolerate nonsense. Both parties. Yes. And have you ever have you ever taken your time as a Bible student to understudy Genesis chapter three? The devil came to Eve, had a conversation with Eve, convinced Eve. Eve fell for the devil. Eve ate the fruit. Eve gave to the husband. But when God came to the garden, the husband was the one that the questioning started. Something had rang a bell, right? Yeah. So a man needs to be ready to take care of his family spiritually because he needs to know what it means to have a wife. Because the woman 
is coming with a different idiosyncrasies. And the attitude of a woman from a different family is coming in. For them to be in for there to be integration, not differentiation. The man need to bear a lot of things and accommodate the wife and shaken the wife to his own taste. And in that process, he shapes himself too to the taste of the wife. That is when marriage has taken place. I want to take you from the young people preparing to get married, and then we're going to go into those who are in the marriage institution. Now, th there are a lot of young people who are waiting or who are in the process, they desire to get married. Uh, can you take us through the steps that one should go through you know, from the point of maybe finding a, a wife or does it start with the person? Can you just go through the steps? The first thing is that let's start from the masculine perspective. Okay. You know, marriage simply means go obtain permission from somebody's father and ask the man to release the daughter to you that you will take her to heaven. Yeah. So when you take this definition, people don't like it. But that's the truth. The man was going to take the daughter to heaven. He said, no, don't worry, I'll help you. I want her to come over this way. We form our family. I assure you, I'll take her to heaven. That's what marriage is all about. So the man needs to be prepared. The man needs to develop, first of all, a disconnect between himself and his father and mother. When he's still mommy's boy, or daddy's boy. He cannot run his family. Someone wrote an article today. I just read today that Nigeria is still an empire of Britain. That anybody that wants to win an election in Nigeria needs to go and obtain permission from Britain. They cited our form, our present president spending two weeks in Britain before 2015 election. He also mentioned a presidential candidate now who has been turning around Britain. That Nigeria is still tied to the airborne stream of Britain. So a man that wants to marry cannot be tied to his mother's airborne stream. You understand what I mean now? Perfectly. So, so a man must first have an independent mind, do godly, to be able to place the mother and father in where they belong. Then he will now begin the search for a woman that will come to complement him. Beauty is important, but it's one over ten. You will get to your destination, though people will laugh at you. But a very good body with a bad engine, the car cannot move. So when you hear, I married, there's no love. No, 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 no. It's not love that is the problem. What the problem is that they are irreconcilable characters. So that's the secret. So you need to now look for a woman that has the fear of God, whose character is blending to the scripture. I'll give an example. I, I preach in a congregation where I told women, obtain permission from your husband before attending a funeral. I know a sister that that is a task. She doesn't know how to condescend to go and obtain permission from the husband before she goes for a burial. Ah, where woman have to I mean, obtain permission. You know, I'm telling you this is because these people were not prepared before the market. You know, when you understand what marriage is all about. I know there was a day we, we are on set, but I have to say this because young people need to learn about it. I needed to have sex with my wife. She said, I'm not feeling fine, but I'm going to uh, allow you because I owe you. My body is yours. I didn't have sex with her again. I saluted her. I saluted her that she realized I have a need. She does not have a right to deny me. It's even though she's not feeling fine, but she knows that I have a need, she'll give to me. That is a woman that understands the scripture. But we know those who say to hell with him, who is he? 
So first, you need someone that really understand God. Be before you move further, I like to I like to say she probably must have saluted you too for for being uh, considerate at that point. I think it's now a two way thing. I, I understand, but first of all, she demonstrated the knowledge of the world. That's true. That she is not doing it because of me, but because there is a command in First Corinthians chapter seven that says she should not deny me. But that command is there when houses where women deny their husbands. So we need to prepare the minds of people who want to marry. See, this is what marriage is all about. And marriage is when you enter, you have entered, there's no window. Death is the only available window. You either pray for your spouse to die so that you can be free. And of course, you know God will not be happy with you that you prayed for her to die. Who does the preparation? He said, the, the man. Prepared. Much of the preparation is on the man. Okay. Who prepares him? He prepares himself, or there are people who are also keeping The church place. prepares him. Okay. The family prepares him, especially his father. The tone of a house is dictated by the man. A woman is a remote control. You press the right channel, you get the right. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you from 17 years of marriage, you press the right channel, the woman will give you the best. You press anyhow channel, she gives you anyhow. So, 80% of how a family is, is dependent on... 70, depending on the man. When I started, when I married, I started working before my wife. I picked my salary, I declared it on the table. She got a job, she picked a salary, she brought on the table. And we planned the family. She earns far more than me. Today we put resources together and we are growing fast. And people are envying, they don't understand the dynamics. But assuming when I collected my salary, I had hid it behind. Now she's working at any big salary, will she bring it on the table? I don't think so. The man is in charge. He dictates the tune, he dictates the tone, he dictates the formula, and he's the chairman, chief executive of his house. So if a man, so that's why in my all of my teaching, I prepare men more. I even prepare them to learn how to have shock absorber. Because the woman, no matter how knowledgeable in the word of God she is, they are still women. First Peter 3, 7 says, dwell with them with understanding. So that your prayers will not be hindered. So many men, including preachers, will go to hell for that passage. Because if you don't dwell with them, that's the daughter of a king. The king who made her know her. Say, do it like manage them. Manage them, you go better. So if you do them anyhow, she will do you anyhow, and your house will scatter. So I want to take you. That's not meaning to say the female should not prepare for marriage. That, that's understood. I, I want to take you on a, on, on, on a post. I cannot remember exactly if it was on a post, but I know either on a post or one of your seminars where you, you, you took a position that. A man who's, who's getting prepared for marriage should, you, you took a position about when the parents should be informed, should be brought into the picture. And it wasn't a very popular opinion yes. that, at, that, at the time. Can you, do you still hold that position? And what is that position? When do parents come into the picture? The parents don't come in immediately okay. for the man. The parents don't come in. But the parents come in immediately for the woman. So let me turn the table the other way. If you are a young woman, and you are about to get married, a young man approaches you, the first person to tell is your parents. Ah, Mr. John is coming after me, I mean, and I'm also interested. I've asked him to come and discuss with you people. You tell the man to come and discuss. If he's very serious, he will come. If he's not serious, he will get angry. And some people take two years to become serious. Uh, well, that is, that is because they are, the woman, the woman, let me tell you. If a man and a woman relates, and the relationship ends, the woman feels the pain if the man has exploited her. So who loses? It's the one that loses that needs a receipt for the property that is about to be bought. If you are buying a land and I'm selling you a land, whether I issue you a receipt or not, it's you that should be demanding a receipt for the payment made. The woman knows that it will lose if the man taps and runs away. So he does traffic control. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Gentle. Please see my father to obtain permission before you touch me. 
Is that too hard? No. That those are the skills we need to prepare. But you see, young women now give in and use sex as a bait. And unfortunately, not helping us. I am speaking this inside the church. And I know what I'm saying. With the prevalent rate of family issues that we have in the church, from my standpoint, I don't know if you share the same opinion or view, it seems it appears that there's an increasing uh, case or there's an increasing case of family crisis here and there. And it's becoming disturbing. It's, what do you think is responsible for this and what can be done? It's because Jesus is absent. When Jesus is in the picture, when both the husband and the wife respect Jesus, there are things they will not do. Absent, the family is going to have crisis. And that was why from the beginning I said the man need to have deep knowledge of the world. He will know how to coordinate the woman and both of them will go to God. I also took from you that the goal is heaven and husbands, spouses should not lose sight of the goal. That is the main goal. So, starting from the preparation to the choice of a spouse, everything. And in fact, let me say this on set. Okay. The choice of who you marry has 50% chance to determine your eternal destiny. I know a man that is married. If he, he feels firm and right single. Wow. He says he's married. So that the world can see, he knows he's single. He's not, he has not yet married. Who is that woman? He says, the wife. By the world definition. That is the man that married and we attended the marriage. What he's seeing is not what he expected. He's disappointed. He sees all women as devil. So each time we meet, I tell him the problem is with you. When you change your strategy, that woman will change. I was going to ask you, because when the issues become so pressing, we hear Christian leaders also make comments like, they say, if not that the Bible does not permit divorce, we would have said, please, part ways. Do you think there is a marriage problem that, is, that has no solution? It's irredeemable. Is there anything? Yes, there are. And there's room for separation. But the man and the woman will not do anything extra until one of them dies. It's called separation, you separate. But you will not look for another woman and she will not look for a man. What are those reasons? Well, when you have irreconcilable differences. Okay. Oh, let me give an example. When I was talking about a man being prepared for marriage, you did not ask me plenty of questions. Are you aware that a man needs to declare his asset and his liability to a woman? Are you aware that the woman needs to declare her liability to a man or her asset? Guess why this man is angry? The man got married. They have difficulty producing children after four years of marriage. From the grapevine, he realized that the little child that is living with them, that was thought to be the, sister's, the wife's sister's child, is actually the child of the wife. Oh. So she sees the child, as the wife, as an embodiment of a liar. Deceit. What of the man that married with two grown-up children hidden somewhere? And as the marriage progresses, the woman gave birth to three females and was struggling to give birth again. The husband said, it's okay. So now I need a male child, so don't worry, I have. Wow. How do you expect that woman to look at it? So that when people don't declare the truth, from, that's why you see my mention, the man need to. Because when the man is standing firm, he will now demand accountability from the woman. On my honor, I have never slept with a woman. On my honor, I don't have any child outside. On my honor, this, I want you to declare. But when the man is not firm in the word of God, even when God will show him the signs, that I know your wife, he will not uh... So it is something that you need to find. I have been telling young people, relax. 
Don't be carried by the quality of the skin. Of course, uh, the social psychologists have helped us now. They have known where our eyes go because the man is designed to like what he sees. The woman is designed to be emotional. You need to touch her before she can come home. For that reason, what a woman looks for, not, uh, of course, if women look for handsome people, I wouldn't even be married. I'm not handsome. Women look for a man that can provide, a man that can take care of their needs. Whereas the men, men look for the one that is literally shining skin, looking good. So for that one reason, there are creams, there are a lot of things that can make a woman be presentable. But the character, the, there's no cream to cure character, apart from the word of God. So you need a woman that, up in issue, understand God before you even go to look for her. You don't need a woman that you are pushing to understand God because you need her. All that you have said, sir, goes back to the Bible, yes. back to God, and it, it's amazing. I think that uh, we should really tune our minds to go back to the basic. You that wants a faithful wife, first of all, be faithful and ask God for a wife, and God will give you a wife. I used to be a very serious minded person. I saw a woman that I liked and I dived in. A woman, September 1st, 2001, I was a student politician then. We went to receive our governor then, Donald Duke in Ogoja. The woman that I had an intention of marrying called me. Say she has prayed the Holy Spirit to her that I'm not the husband. That's how the relationship ended. I married the one I married. Each time I remember, I said, God, you love me. You just, you just de delivered me out of fire. It's of recent, it's very clear that we are related. Yeah. From the same maternal family. So, I would have married, the, the, leave it. Sometimes when God shows you the thing to run, run. But sometimes we insist, no, God, that is the one I want. I love, I love her. I love you. Don't understand love. It's when you are inside the marriage and the woman does magic and you look left and right. You are, you are asked, if I go and read Hosea, he was made to marry a prostitute. God wanted Hosea to learn how angry it is to marry. But that's how Israel is behaving like a prostitute, going to befriend other gods. So if you marry a woman that gives you headache, you will understand why the beer parlors have people. Till this time, late in the night, they are still there. Some people can't go home. There's no excitement them going home. See, we need to talk about marriage. For young people that are preparing, we need to sit them down. Tell them, calm down. What is it that you want? Do you want a fat woman? Marry a fat woman. If you like a slim one, marry a slim one. If you like a fat woman and mistakenly marry a slim one, the day you see a fat or in the church, you will be married, but you are not married. Because that was what you liked. So you need to know what you like. And when you get what you like, fine. Oh, self-discovery first. Yes. Do you think the church, as one of the principal actors in preparation for marriage, is doing enough? The as church is doing 10%. Of what she's supposed to do? Yes, and the, the, the young people are not prompting the church to do more. We need to put the preachers on their toes to demand counseling from them. They were not. And the church, too, with so many multiplicity of problems, are not even looking at that direction. But that's a time bomb for the future. I want to tell you, pass a questionnaire around men. Take 200 men randomly and keep, give them, ask one question. Are you satisfied with your marriage? Speak the truth. The result might be shocking. I don't think we can exhaust this discussion in one city. Yeah. We hope to have you again, Brother Mike. It will be my pleasure. To talk about this. 
It's been an exciting conversation on marriage with Brother Mike Udam. He is a minister serving at the Opagada community in Cross River State, Nigeria. And he's been with us on COC TV. My name is Gentu Wamana. Thank you for your time. Welcome to COC TV, where we have Bible perspective on issues. My name is Gentu Wamana. And today in the studio, we have Brother Charles Ni Odoi. He is the preacher of Church of Christ Odoko Accra, Ghana. Brother Charles is a missionary.